Um, and for me, for people who don't know me, my name is Dr. Srini Gangasani. I'm a cardiologist and current CME chair for RP. Uh, we, in the series of the CME lectures, and this week, this month is a lifestyle medicine. I think we have a really two great speakers today to let us know uh, what we can do to prevent any kind of uh, future complications from our health. But before we go any further, I would like to have Ravi Kohli, who is, could not be make it today to the CME because of his son's wedding today. So he sent us a brief message. Vijay, can you play uh, Dr. Ravi Kohli, president of RP's message? While we are waiting for Vijay to play the message, I think uh, next December we're going to take off because the GHS and a lot of activities going on in uh, RP. So we're not going to have a CME, but in January, we're going to have a great CME for board, how to deal with the board. I was appointed to the Georgia Medical Board about a year ago. In the last one year, I've learned so much about how doctors can get into trouble and how what do we need to do to not to get in trouble and what to do with the board. So we have a panel of board members, current board members and the past board members from different states so that we can learn from some somebody else's experiences that we have to go through the experiences. So January, I'm working on getting that panel of uh, past board members to have the, the CME uh, so that uh, we can learn from each other so that we don't get into trouble. So that is the CME from January. And also we have a few other medical legal kind of a, a panelists coming from both uh, all practice attorneys and the defense attorneys to look at how we can learn from the legal point of view in probably March or April. So really good series of speakers scheduled to give the talks uh, on RP CME channel for the next year. Um, yeah, can you go? If you can go, then I'll uh, introduce Dr. Pankaj Wish to proceed with the program. Good morning, Dr. Ravi Kohli, President of AAPI. Sorry, I'm unable to join today for an important uh, CME program, but I wish uh, the program a great success and all the participants learn a lot and practice it in their uh, personal life as well as in their clinical practice to teach our uh, patients the best of uh, lifestyle medicine so they can reverse the diseases as well as pre prevent any bad outcomes going forward. Thank you and have a great time. Thank you to Ravi for taking a few minutes out of his great uh, busy day in his son's wedding day to give us a little message. So uh, let's go on with the CME. Now I would like to introduce our, my good friend, Pankaj Vij, a brilliant internal medicine doctor, a writer, and a lifestyle medicine uh, the chief at uh, Kaiser Permanente in California. I think he's done a wonderful job over the last few years. We were residents together. He was brilliant, graduate from All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences, and he was a great resident, great co-resident, and he has, doing so many, he has done so many things over the last uh, 25 years uh, since we left the, the residency. I'm looking forward to Pankaj doing this uh, great CME with uh, absolutely wonderful speakers. Thank you, all of you, for taking time today to join and uh, get, introduce us to new changes in lifestyle medicine, so what we can do. I'm a cardiologist, but I'm really interested to see what Kaushik is going to say, even though my patients want to get more stents than the carrots, but let's see what the talk is going to be so that we can learn from you. Thank you. Pankaj, please take over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Srini, for that warm introduction. And big thanks to both of our speakers who are uh, taking time away from their busy weekends to educate us. I'm super excited. I've been very excited about lifestyle medicine, at least for the last uh, six years or so, because lifestyle medicine is the evidence-based approach to manage, treat, and often reverse chronic diseases. And I'm delighted to see over 100 people, 114 people attending who would like to learn how we can manage this tsunami of chronic disease that we all deal with every single day. So without further ado, let's get the program started. Our very first speaker is my dear friend, Dr. Kaushik Reddy, who's an interventional cardiologist. And I've known Kaushik 
also for about five years, uh, we both met at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And uh, Kaushik is the first interventional cardiologist in the world to become certified in lifestyle medicine. So he's a real hero for us. He is a fellow of the College of Lifestyle Medicine, FACLM. He is a certified lifestyle medicine intensivist. He's the ninth person in the world. And there are only 15 people in the world on planet Earth to be certified as lifestyle medicine intensivists. He's a co-founder of the Veterans Health Administration, where he works at the VA, and the Department of uh, Defense Member Interest Group in Lifestyle Medicine. He co-founded the Cardiology Member Interest Group in ACLM, and he's serving on the ACLM, American College of Lifestyle Medicine's board as a treasurer for the second term. That's right, he already did one term, and now he's on his second term as treasurer of the board. I don't know how many hours he has in his day. He has at least 42 hours when I count all the things that he's doing. Uh, but hats off to you, Kaushik, and over to you. Please educate us. Thank you, Pankaj. Thank you, Srini, for those kind words of introduction. And in the interest of time, I'm going to dive, uh, dive right into the presentation. Uh, this is my introductory slide. And again, Pankaj, thank you for those kind words of introduction. And in terms of lifestyle medicine, you know, something that has started as a, a personal inquiry into reinvent myself as a physician has quickly transitioned into a passion. And from passion, now it has become my life's mission to take this message of disease prevention and health promotion through the pillars of lifestyle medicine to as many people as possible across the planet. And, um, you know, and this is a part of that effort. And I'm happy to work together with a lot of leaders in API and, uh, and continue the momentum and especially take this message back home uh, to, to India. So uh, I work for the VA, but I'm not representing the VA in, uh, in this presentation. And uh, the only conflict of interest, if I want to call it that, I run a nonprofit here in Tampa Bay area called the PBLM.org, Plant Based Lifestyle Movement, which is again an extension of this effort to take this message to the lay people. Uh, to, because I, you know, we, I, I want to try as much as I can. Uh, people to stay as healthy people and not become my patients. So, but I'm still the guy who now accept, you know, does this fairly advanced cardiovascular procedures as Srini would now, uh, except I am the crazy cardiologist who <laughs> enters the cardiac cath lab uh, with a bunch of carrots on his lead. Uh, but I'm also the crazy cardiologist who uh, has a pair of scrubs that he wears while he's rounding and teaching and doing procedures where right under my name, it says I have a carrot and a stent you pick. And as all of you know, those of you who are physicians, uh, that carrot is not an exact replacement for a stent, but it's a metaphor. It's a message on a scrub top, if you want to call it that, uh, to, to as a conversation starter to get the dialogue going. And uh, uh, recently, about a year ago, at the request of the VA at the national level, I, again, I, uh, I work full-time for the VA, but I'm faculty at USF where uh, I'm teaching. Uh, at the request of the VA, I did a TED talk titled, I have a carrot and a stand, uh, which I strongly ask all of you to look up and share. Uh, again, I'm not trying to promote my own YouTube channel. It's not even on my YouTube channel. It's a federal property, um, but it's a 15 minute flavor for everything I'm about to talk to you today. So if you go to Google and type carrot and stent, it's usually the first hit. So let's get into this discussion today, right? I want to start our conversation today with two questions. One is what is health, right? Even, you know, most of us, I'm guessing most of us on the audience here are physicians, right? So despite being physicians, we seldom take an opportunity. We seldom sit down for even a few minutes to contemplate and ask ourselves for this question. What does health actually mean to us, right? We are the quote unquote healthcare providers. But it turns out that there is an actual definition put forth by the World Health Organization at the time of the, when the constitution for the World Health Organization was, was, was put together uh, when it was founded, that health is not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, but a total presence of physical, mental, and social well-being. One could go on to add spiritual well-being because that approach works for a lot of people, right? 
And the next question, I, what I usually do is that when I give the exact same talk, but a little bit of a toned down version of it from a science and a graphs type of thing, uh, I do this every Friday to a large group of veterans at the hospital and have been running the program for four years. Uh, but we do a little exercise when I put up this question, why do you want to be healthy? And if I were to do the same with you, all of you, and it, uh, you know, no matter how descriptive, how detailed and how emotional those answers are as to why you want to be healthy, is nobody's ever going to answer that I'm, I want to be healthy because I love going seeing Dr. Gangasani and Dr. Reddy in their cardiac cath lab. That's why I want to be healthy. Somehow that is never the answer, right? All of our answers, all of our answers, no matter what country, what nationality, what ethnicity, what race, what gender, what religion that we belong to can be summarized into two broad reasons. That's it. I don't think there's a third reason why a human being wants to be healthy. And one of those reasons is quality of life, right? As to, again, we should not let somebody else define what our quality of life is, right? We have to deeply question that and ask ourselves what, what that is. And the second one is quality of life, right? Although I'm showing these two as two separate entities, as everyone knows, these are intricate, inseparable components of why a human being wants to be healthy, tightly wound as two sides of a coin. What I would like to do is probably, this is the slide that I'm gonna spend the most time, is I wanna walk you through a journey of past 100 years of human existence in this country, uh, using those two reasons as to why anybody wants to be healthy, quality plotted against longevity or the quantity of life. In, as far back as 1920, just 100 years ago, an average person in America died at the age of 45. Unfortunately, during those short 45 years of life, the quality of life went down very rapidly, right? So much so that the graph looked like a triangle because they did not have access to many things that we take for granted, including universal access to public sanitation, universal access to vaccination, antibiotics, or universal access to healthcare, which unfortunately we are still struggling. That's a different argument for another talk. In 2022, yes, we are living much longer, which by the way needs, needs a slight correction. It's no longer 78, as some of you may know. Uh, reasons are different, but it is uh, unfortunately shrinking. Uh, but compared to 1920, yes, we are living much, much, much longer. But unfortunately, today's life's graph plotted against quality and longevity looks like a convoluted, bizarre shape down the slope of which we begin to accumulate diseases. And why would I put accumulated diseases and start with the diet? It's extremely important that I, as to why I start with diet, because most people in this country, and unfortunately in most parts of the world, are making a, a, a very you know, unfortunate decision, for lack of better words, of weaning our babies off of breastfeeding at six to eight months, while the recommendation by almost all medical organizations is to extend it to for up to at least two years. That one dietary decision has generational implications, especially if the baby that's being fed is a female. As a consequence of that and many other factors, childhood obesity is on the rise like I never imagined possible. And most of us, when we went to medical school in India, I don't think we ever remember seeing a type two diabetic child, which is now close to you know, combination of impaired fasting glucose and diabetes is nearing almost 11 to 14% amongst pediatric population. And as a consequence of diabetes and erectile male erectile dysfunction is now becoming uh, a, a very commonplace combination of hypertension and hyperlipidemia that we know of is almost one third, if not more of the population. And no wonder why heart disease continues to be the leading cause of death, a stroke or two in the middle, and then congestive heart failure, which I call the scourge of the 21st century, which we did not see that much. But now I don't think any cardi cardiologist can round between five patients in the hospital, not even his or her entire service, just to see five patients, chances are that two of those are gonna be congestive heart failure. So yes, folks, we are living longer, but we are also dying longer. What do I mean by that is that yes, I'm alive, but I can't even go pick up my mail because of severe diabetic neuropathy. Yes, I'm alive, but I'm not on a cruise ship with my grandchildren because I'm hooked up to a dialysis machine. Yes, I'm alive, but I am not at the dinner table for Christmas, Thanksgiving, or Diwali, or uh, any other festival uh, because I'm in a nursing home being tube fed because of a stroke related to diabetes and hypertension, which are preventable close to 90% of the time at a population level. 
So if you average all of this, DALY, disability adjusted loss of years in America is 23.6 years. That's how much time we are living due to disease and disability that is preventable. Yes, we are living longer, but we are also dying longer. That's what I mean. What I argue is that given the luxury that we have uh, and this concrete knowledge that we have that majority of these diseases are preventable, can we at least make a sincere attempt where we do the best we can, both from a professional and a personal standpoint, to maintain the quality of life at a very high level as the green line uh, indicates. And when the time comes, when the time comes and I picked 100 because it's a nice number, <laughs> we drop. I call this concept simply the concept of living longer and dying shorter instead of living longer and dying longer. Social anthropologists call this concept the rectangularization of life, meaning that at any given time when we die, sooner or later, that graph should look like a rectangle, right? And I simply call it the concept of living life like you're in a box because no matter how hard we try, sooner or later, we're all gonna end up in a box. My humble plea to myself, my family, my patients, and the society at large is let's not be the cause of it, right? I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want it to be my fault. But when I say my fault, what I mean by that is that healthy, the very word healthy for discussions such as this can be broken apart into heal thyself, meaning that majority of staying healthy is actually in our hands. And hopefully I'll be able to convince you on that point by the time I'm done with this presentation. But when I say it's also in, in our hands, it, it, it pains me to show this slide, but because these words written in Chicago Tribune as far back as 1975, uh, ring true, if not more so today than they did in 75, that the idea of preventive medicine is faintly un-American. It means first recognizing that the enemy is us. Again, when I say the words enemy is us, I'm not saying those words with the intent of shifting the blame onto a professional, not with the intent of shifting the blame onto a patient, a friend, or a loved one family member, but it is with the, the deep sense of holding ourselves accountable holding ourselves accountable and starting the journey with a very clear distinction between health promotion and disease management. Because adding a fourth blood pressure medication for uncontrolled blood pressure is not health promotion, this disease management. Skillfully inserting the fourth stent in the same blood vessel for stable ischemic heart disease is not health promotion, it is disease management. And the list goes on so much so that I, in a paper that I'm writing right now, I am actually challenging the profession by asking if the, if the letters MD next to my name merely mean manager of disease, because that's what most of us do. Most of what we do is not health promotion, but disease management. And we are extremely good at that, right? But as a consequence of that degree of societal neglect on a professional and a personal level, we have now become a country where six in 10 of us have at least one common chronic preventable diseases. And four in 10 of us have at least two common chronic preventable diseases. And we treat them every single day, right? And, and it's very concerning. And because the cost is accumulating $4.1 trillion a year. So what are these diseases doing? So what are the leading causes of death in the contemporary times in the middle of a catastrophic global pandemic? Would you believe me if I told you only, now well, I don't want to say only, but 345,000 lives were lost due to COVID. As staggering and as scary as that number may be, look at this number. A vastly preventable heart disease killed at twice as many. Right. We know this from extensive data that this disease is preventable at a population level in close to 85%. Same thing repeated in 2021. So my question is, where is, where is the public outcry? Where is the professional outcry? Where is the collective political and policy outcry? And let's take a look at how the journey started. So if you look at the history of cardiovascular disease burden in America, there has been a tremendous progress. I'm not going to discount that. So medicine has accomplished, technically, I would not even say the medicine has accomplished a lot. If you look at the trending down of this, all these curves, it's been due to one single federal policy, not because of the stents, not because of the pharmaceuticals, certainly not because of the systems improvement, but telling America that smoking is injurious to your health. We're still seeking the benefits out of it. But unfortunately, starting 2010 till now, 
the heyday of cardiovascular medicine, some of the greatest and the coolest tools and toys, procedural management, systems improvement, pharmaceutical advances. If you look at the curves, they are flatlined. There hasn't been all, not even a single percent of decline in the past 10 to 12 years of cardiovascular mortality. Not only has there not been a decline, the biggest killer is making a deadly comeback because it is now affecting younger people, it's affecting women, it's affecting non-smokers who are falling victims due to the skyrocketing you know, twindemic, I call it obesity and diabetes. So to outline this, you know, in 2019, Wall Street Journal outlined the story and the life and the death, premature death of this young man who apparently had been on blood pressure medications, who had been on cholesterol medications, and who ate healthy, we'll talk about that in a minute, and worked out regularly, and despite all of that, died at 49 of a massive anterior wall MI and leaving behind a beautiful family. And, 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 and this is the situation when I say that the deadly disease makes it, you know, come back is because combination of obesity and overweight is now nearing 80%. When I came to America in 94, there was not a single state in the union, not a single state in the union where the combination of obesity or overweight exceeded more than 20%. In less than one generation, we, are, we can't find a state in the union where the combination is less than 20%. Right? So all of this happened so quickly. And where are we headed? Where are we headed? So this paper just came out a month ago. And looking at cardiovascular trends, risk factor trends, or risk factor control in individuals with established CAD. So this is secondary prevention. Right? Guidelines have been written, written extensively well. But what is shocking is A1C is not controlled in close to half the patients. Blood pressure is not controlled in close to half the patients right? Non-HDL cholesterol is not controlled in up to 70% of patients. BMI is not controlled in close to 80% of patients. We just talked about it a couple of slides ago. Smoking, 20% of people with coronary artery disease established as CAD are still using some form of tobacco, right? Close to 80% are not even meeting the bare minimum requirements for physical activity. And here is the shocker. 99.99% are not meeting the American Heart Association diet. So as a consequence of this, the editorial that went with this paper, appropriately so, called this trend a population level code blue. So let that sink in, my colleagues, let that sink in. Now, where are we headed? Is diabetes expected to be go up? Imagine an America where diabetes is up by 40%. Imagine an America where hypertension is up by 27% dyslipidemia by another 27% and obesity by another 18%. And as a consequence of that, ischemic heart disease is gonna go up by 30%. Heart failure is gonna go up by another 33%. Myocardial infarction by about 17 and stroke by another 34%. This is between 2025 and 2060, which is not that far out. That's where we are headed because this is despite all the advances that we have made in cardiovascular medicine and hence, we need to switch to lifestyle medicine because we know data is crystal clear, but despite that much data, how much time are we engaging ourselves into empower ourselves as a society? These are the Google trends for United States before COVID. Does anybody see heart disease? People who are in the lifestyle medicine space know who this man is. And <laughs> this is a joke I make. You know, I, tried, I ask all of you to read that book if you haven't yet, How Not to Die. In that book, there is a chapter, How Not to Die of Heart Disease, because nobody is engaged in this conversation at a societal level, right? While I come across like I'm blaming the society, how about my own self, my profession of cardiology? So a good friend of mine, not too far from here in Florida, she uh, and a couple of other people that we know, we did a survey, right? So we surveyed 930 cardiovascular specialists and 90% reported minimal or no training absolutely minimal or no training in evidence-based clinical nutrition, while, while diet-induced risk is the leading cause of cardiovascular disease, disability, and death. That's the that's, that's Correct me if I'm wrong, fellow cardiologists in the audience, if you have received any evidence-based clinical nutrition in your training, I would like to know, right? So most of us don't receive any training. So despite not receiving any training, most cardiologists agreed that nutrition is important. Most cardiologists did. And most cardiologists also agreed that it is so important that it is their responsibility 
It is their responsibility to teach nutrition to their patients. So, so far, so good. So far, so good. So if we feel, despite not having that much training, we feel that nutrition is so important that it is our responsibility to teach this to our patients and our families. The next question is, if I may paraphrase Gandhi, right? am I being the change that I wanna to bring to the world? That's when this question becomes very useful, that we ask the same group of cardiologists and cardiology trainees that are you yourself eating three to five servings of fruits and vegetables as indicated by ACC AHA guidelines and turns out that not even 30% are doing so. No wonder heart disease continues to be the leading cause of death amongst American cardiologists, right? So when I realized this, we wrote a paper in 2018 outlining an urgent need to incorporate evidence-based nutrition and lifestyle medicine into medical training. And then subsequently, at the request of American College of Lifestyle Medicine, uh, the Journal of Family Practice, we chose this journal because it is officially the most circulated journal, a print journal in the United States. So it's a 60-page free download if you, anybody wants to look at the totality of lifestyle medicine as it relates to all aspects of health. Uh, I wrote the cardiovascular section on this. And we recently expanded that and published a 16-page paper with close to 250 contemporary citations just got published about a couple of weeks ago in American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. And, um, you know, and when I talk about an urgent, urgent unmet need, I usually like to start with our children because this is the 2022 American Heart Association statistics. And when we compile the prevalence of cardiovascular risk factors amongst American youth and adults, and when you especially look at the healthy diet score as defined by the American heart, for ages 12 to 19, the signal is statistically undetectable. It's been listed for the past 20 years, at least if not longer, for as long as I've been in cardiology, it's been listed as 0.0. .0. Folks, that's not a typo. It is literally listed as 0.0%. The children provide this unique window of opportunity, unique window of opportunity where we invest in their health from preconception, I would say, the benefits are phenomenal, but we don't do that. We invest in them only when they are burdened with risk factors and disease. And people ask me, how early? How early is too early? This is from the 2022 American Heart's update on prevention. And they say, you know, life course window, but I simply call it from womb to tomb or from lust to dust. That's where we should invest in lifestyle medicine. If not, if we don't do that, this is what happens to our children. Another brand new data, and if you look at the Z-scores, it is really shocking as to what would happen to children who accumulate cardiovascular risk factor at a young age and their entire life's course of events. And we spend enormous money, enormous money to take care of these children when they become adults. And as a consequence of you know, that degree of neglect, again, despite spending that much money, when we list the healthiest countries on the planet, somehow we are never to be found. And in terms of... <laughs> physician compensation, right? The, I, I should not even be doing presentations like this, right? I am an interventional cardiologist. My job, my job is to save your life when everything else fails. But guess what, folks? On a systems level, we are failing the people who are actually trained to keep us healthy, right? Our Department of Public Health folks, our pediatricians, our family practitioners, they are unfortunately literally the lowest paid. And if you don't believe me, take a look at this. Smoking cessation counseling literally the most important besides vaccination and antibiotics and public sanitation, probably if not certainly the most powerful preventative tool. We live in a system where that most preventative tool gets an RVU of 0.24, right? And if you do it for more than 10 minutes, you get a 0.5, half an RVU, which is 45, 45, not percent, but 45 fold lower in value than an elective PCI for which you have to struggle to find a class one indication. So, and then ignorantly and arrogantly so, we call this a healthcare system. It is not a healthcare system, this is a disease management system. We are the entire emphasis on tertiary care very, with very little emphasis on public health promotion. So the onus is on all of us. The reason I say the onus is on all of us is because it takes five to make a fist. It takes a drop and a drop and a drop to make an ocean. So how do we change this? How do we change this? Is This is what I have to offer, is focusing, completely changing the paradigm at no matter what level of care that we get involved with the patient and his or her family is to focus on the pillars of lifestyle medicine. 
And as a part of that, we have uh, three major organizations that are supporting us, and I strongly urge you to look into all of them, American College of Lifestyle Medicine and American Board of Lifestyle Medicine and the Indian Society of Lifestyle Medicine, which I was very closely involved from the very foundation and up. They just had their annual meeting. So especially those of us you know, in the RP circles, I strongly urge you to look into this and uh, come join us at the 2023 American College of Lifestyle Medicine meeting in Denver. Uh, Colorado and uh, maybe take the board exam. So the next question is to get any of this done, right? It's any of this done at an individual level, professional level, and a personal level. The first pillar is to start with mindfulness, right? We have to be mindful. Then you ask me mindful about what, right? The kind of mindfulness I'm talking about is I'm not expecting you to come to discussion like this or my lectures to my patients and show up next week with a, with a rosary in your hand and a halo behind your head. That's not the kind of mindfulness I'm asking you to be about. The kind of mindfulness I talk about is be mindful of the answer that you would give to yourself. But even as physicians, when you ask yourself, because despite being physicians, we are just as human as any one of our patients right? Why do you want to be healthy? That's all I'm asking is to be mindful about that answer. And once you're mindful, it's not something that you just walk into one day and become this mindful master. You have to actively seek it. How do you seek it? You know, start with the beginner's mind. You know, when I found my, the need to reinvent myself, re-educate myself, retrain in another board specialty, I, I had no clue about any of this. So I started with the beginner's mind and I was non-judgmental. And I was patient. I was accepting of both my successes, celebrating them. I was also accepting and learning from my mistakes and failures. And I was not striving. This was not never a competition for me. It was almost an introspection and you know, reinvention and trust. Trust your mentors, trust your message, but verify, of course. And letting go, when you fail, let go. Again, I did not invent this circle. This circle is extremely well-tested, has been proven to be beneficial in the matters of motivational interviewing or behavior modification, and it works, absolutely works. Another simplistic way of looking at it is, you know, people like Pankaj sitting on the mountaintop. Hey folks, I have went through this path. I have gone through this path. I am gonna do you guys a favor. I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna throw you a ladder. Heck, I'm gonna throw you two ladders, pick one right? One with steps three feet apart, one with steps 10 feet apart. So that's all my message is take those baby steps so you don't have to step into the cardiac cath lab. So where is the evidence? Is this just talk or is there actual evidence of any higher level to support these pillars? The first, speaking of support, the first and foundational thing is social support. That is the foundational pillar of lifestyle medicine. Because if I'm asking a 65, 70 year old combat veteran from Vietnam who lives alone, but he is willing to make a difference. He is sick and tired of injecting himself with insulin needles. He's sick and tired of taking six medications just to keep his blood sugar and blood pressure under control. But he lives alone, he has a very limited financial means. The first and the foremost is to offer support because whosoever is delighted in solitude is either a wild beast or a god. Okay, so because we just are not programmed from an evolutionary perspective to live in isolation, because in terms of you know, support, is that you you make a person as though they are feel cared for. They feel esteemed. They're, they feel part of a network with mutual obligations. That's where the key is, is mutual obligations that hold us ourselves accountable without you even knowing about it, right? Those of us who grew up in the villages in India, we kind of know this as to what this actually means, which unfortunately is being rapidly eradicated for various reasons. But this is brand new. The National Academy of Sciences this year earlier published almost a 300 page document, extremely well detailed about the importance of social connections. And what we know from this data and many other databases, if you're 65 years and older, and if you self-report living a life in social isolation, your risk of having an index MI or stroke is identical to that of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That is the risk equivalency. And the way it works is that people who are with poor social connections also tend to make poorer lifestyle choices because of life of psychological stressors. And as a, as a consequence of that, adherence with a lot of lifestyle factors and also appropriate medical therapy kind of goes down. Your biomarkers start going up and your morbidity goes up and your mortality goes up. Right? So the biology of this has been extensively well studied, and we know that in a large systematic meta-analysis of about 
20 longitudinal observational studies, what we found was that a poor social relationships, poor social relationships increase the risk of CHD by about 29% and stroke by 32%. Right, and this is, I, I know this author personally, and uh, she is from, uh, she's the chair of psychology at Harvard, and she did a meta-analysis of compiling about 148 observational studies. And what she concluded was that people, if you wanna live to be 100, right, your 50% increased likelihood they based on strong social relationships. That actually has the highest yield. The next one is smoking. I just want to show one slide and 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 and, and kind of a segue into a broader question. You know, do I need to talk about smoking in 2022? The answer is yes, because some of the pictures that you see here used to be advertisements inside of a medical journal. I shall name not, I shall not name the journal, but they used to be journal in, inside of a medical journal. And if you want to get into a deep dive, please read that book, Sit the Cigarette, a Political History. The reason I show this is that something very similar is happening with food now because we live and work in, well, I don't know, some of us live in the hospitals, uh, but uh, we work in hospitals where the system promotes the sale of burgers while we are doing balloons and bypass on the same floor. Right? Burgers, doctor's choice, because we are a part of that system and we, we play a blind eye to this. My question is very simple. Burgers, balloons, and bypass on the same floor, do we have the moral authority to look in the eye of a patient and his or her family and say, eat healthy? Next one is alcohol, right? If you drink alcohol, drink it for 25, 30 other reasons, but please don't even touch a drop of alcohol thinking that it's good for you. It is not. It's been listed as a class one carcinogen for at least 47 years. All right, so three in the UK Biobank never stops giving because we get a publication, at least from cardiology, almost on a weekly basis. And especially here in this year, a few months ago, they looked at uh, both linear and nonlinear Mendelian randomization data and concluded that even in habitual drinkers with very small alcohol consumption, the risk increase is linear, almost linear, meaning that there's no safe limit. There's absolutely no safe limit to alcohol when it comes to cardiovascular health. Based on that, the World Heart, World Heart Federation, uh, appropriately so, they updated their guidelines, the US guidelines. Unfortunately, if you look at the rest of the world, the most lenient of dietary guidelines and alcohol guidelines are American. The next one is stress. Right, and this is a nice review article, well, not a review article, but a more of an op-ed in uh, New York Times a few months ago. And we know this, you know, those of you who are in cardiology, this is something that got nailed into our brains when we were fellows, that at, for every cardiovascular risk factor, those are the odds ratios, right? But when you add stress, when you add stress, look at what happens. For, for any given cardiovascular risk factor, this is Salim's use of paper from Interheart, uh, one of those things pretty much written in concrete in cardiovascular medicine, the importance of psychological and social risk factors. Exponentially, the hazard ratio and the odds ratios go up. And the mechanisms, you know, is centrally mediated, increases hypertension, adiposity, and insulin resistance, right? And also increases sympathetic nervous activity, increases and, and uh, uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis, which you can actually map now. We can actually map with some of the newer CT and MRI imaging that there's at an a, a endothelial level, there is increased inflammation, increased plaque rupture, and increased events, right? And this is the 2021 circulation paper. And I strongly urge you, especially those of you who are primary care doctors and also cardiologists to look into this American Heart's scientific statement as to how to recognize depression and stress and how to counsel our patients uh, while we're seeing them for cardiovascular reasons. And we also know that people who have you know, mental stress versus ischemic stress, quote unquote, the stress test. It's very important. Just look at the, at the hazard ratios. They quadruple compared to no ischemia versus ischemia plus psychosocial stress. One could argue from an epidemiological point of view, this could be causally linked. So extremely, extremely important to screen for this to stress and psychological factors when we see patients in cardiovascular medicine. And the beauty is that treating that and addressing that actually lowers events. That's the beauty of this. And, uh, you know, working with a couple of good people, some of you know, uh, uh, Srini may know her, uh, she is at Beaumont. Uh, we wrote a chapter in this book last year on stress and cardiovascular disease. The next one is physical activity. And this is kind of very, very it's, a, it's a huge issue within Indian diaspora, but even as a country in the US, not even a quarter of people are meeting the bare minimum requirements as to what exercise should be. 
And, and what it should be is not too much. Just go for a walk every 30, you know, 30 minutes a day, at least four to five days a week. And if you're a runner, if you can do something more vigorous, do it for at least three times a week. And it has psychological benefits, antiarrhythmic benefits, antithrombotic benefits, antiatherosclerotic benefits, and hemodynamics. Right, all of these things. This is this is literally medicine. Exercise is literally medicine. So much so, just walking a few steps—a neat idea. Just walking a few steps, non-exercise activity, thermogenesis. That's what NEAT stands for. So, just build this. Just like make your hospital a blue zone, right? Take the stairs, park at the farther end of the hospital, and before you know, you got your fifteen thousand steps. Next one is sleep. If you haven't read this book, I strongly urge every physician to read this book. Why we sleep. And nobody said it better than Gandhi himself that each night when I go to bed, each night when I go to sleep, I die. And the next morning when I wake up, I am reborn, right? And Param is going to talk a lot about this in the next hour, but all-cause mortality, CVD, CHD, stroke, everything is that magical window, seven to eight hours. Yes, easier said than done, but that's what we should aim for, right? And now we have a causal link. Again, UK Biobank showing clearly the short sleep duration less than six hours has a 20% increased higher ratio of CVD and a longer sleep duration greater than nine hours. And the beauty with this is that this was independent of genetic traits. And hence, you can deduce causal relationships. And precisely why, as some of you may know this, cardiologists, sleep got just added as the eighth pillar a couple of months ago to American Heart Association recommendations. Right, same thing with diabetes. The magical window is somewhere between seven to eight hours. And this is an amazing, I, could, I just couldn't believe when I read this paper a couple of months ago that people are still doing sleep deprivation randomized control trials. Param, I wanna hear your take on this when you speak, is that, but clearly within just four weeks, 21 days actually, 21 days, three weeks of sleep deprivation, people gained 7.8 centimeters of visceral adiposity consuming 308 calories in excess a day, right? And hence the addition of sleep as the eighth, you know, it used to be life's simple seven, now it's life's essential eight. And what I joke around is that when it comes to, this is my numbers, when you go to life's essential eight, I am scored at 97.5. The only reason I get dinged at three and a half points is because I say I don't eat fish. But the good news is that I'm driving my life better than I'm driving my Tesla. So here is a website I strongly urge you to go. If you're not a sleep expert, I learned a lot from this is to keep the times consistent, keep the bedroom quiet, dark and relaxing, keep the temperature slightly a degree or two lower than what you're comfortable with. And no electronic devices, please avoid large meals, caffeine and alcohol and crack, bring, you know, squeeze in that exercise, you'll sleep better. The next one, the big one is nutrition. When it comes to nutrition, up until now, nobody argues about these five or six pillars, but when it comes to nutrition, boy, everybody wants to fight. So while the keto and the phyto are fighting the battle, the cheeto is winning the war, right? So here is the reason why, why a cardiologist want to talk about nutrition is because diet-induced risk is among the top causes, contributory causes for, for cardiovascular disease. Fundamental mistake, when you think about diet, please stop thinking about diet as macromolecules because you never went shopping saying to yourself or your spouse that you're going to buy six carbs, eight fats, and nine proteins for dinner tonight. We don't think of food that way. Think of food this way. Stop eating processed junk, okay? Because 58% of American calories come from crap, calorie-rich and processed food. Right? And for every additional serving, your cardiovascular mortality goes up by 7%. Every additional serving. right? And nutrition and risk factors. Number one risk factors. More people die from hypertension than alcohol, motor vehicle accidents, and tobacco combined. Yet FDA's requirement to approve a new blood pressure drug is three. That's all you need, three millimeters of mercury. Once you show, once you show safety, the efficacy endpoint for the FDA approval is three millimeters. Most drugs alone or in combination drop it by six. DASH diet with moderate salt restriction drops blood pressure on a compliant patient by up to 20, 20, 20 to 20 millimeters. Please note that the original DASH trial did not include salt restriction. Hence, very few, less than 8% of all cardiovascular guidelines bear a class one with level of evidence A. DASH diet is one of them, but I don't remember the last time any one of us met a DASH rep trying to sell broccoli and vegetables in our clinics. So sodium restriction and increased dietary potassium, not as a supplement, but fruits and vegetables. 
Same thing with for lipids. We have enormous data, multiple randomized trials that vegetarian diet, especially when the intent of treatment is primary prevention, can be used as an alternate for drug therapy. And if anybody questions the, 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 the idea of saturated fat, this is an extremely well done meta-analysis of every dot on this linear line is a feeding experiment, literally a controlled feeding experiment using at least three equations. If anybody challenges this, all that I humbly ask is to prove that equation, one of those equations wrong in one human being. Hence, healthy lifestyle sits at the very top of lipid lowering guidelines. Same thing for diabetes. This is a famous slide from New England Journal of Medicine. Intensive lifestyle therapy reduced the development of diabetes in at-risk individuals by 58% in three years. Same thing from Finland and China. This is actually from China. We have a 30-year follow-up of a randomized controlled trial with close to 40% reduction in the development of type 2 diabetes amongst at-risk individuals, right? And this is the Finland data. Same thing, 34% at 10 years. The new guidelines from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology clearly support a plant-based diet as the primary source. And if anybody wants to read this book, I strongly suggest this man should be either nominated or may even win a Nobel Prize one day for teaching us what he taught about diabetes. And in terms of inflammatory index of diet, this is a beautiful paper from Jack and a couple of years ago, clearly showing the red meats, the processed meats, the organ meats, the refined carbohydrates, the sweetened beverages are the ones that are the highest inflammatory index. But as opposed to green leafy vegetables, colored vegetables, meaning that the, your plate should look like a rainbow. And uh, so here are the guidelines, right? American College of Cardiology guidelines, clearly tell you a diet should be predominantly a whole food plant-based diet. The 2021 into 2022 European Society of Cardiology guidelines for prevention clearly outline one table with all class one indications when it comes to alcohol reduction and eating a plant predominant diet. So when I say plant-based diet, please be mindful, right? These items that I show here are also plant-based. Just because something is plant-based doesn't mean that it is healthy. It has to be a healthy plant-based diet, right? And this is this is same came from the VA system. Believe it or not, the, now the VA has the world's largest biobank, and it looked at the plant-based diet index amongst veterans. And what blew my mind was our data is identical. For major chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes, the healthfulness of a plant-based diet is what matters. Okay, and uh, and same thing also. You can do this by racial separation to see if this matters to any unique population. Turns out the message is crystal clear. Right. So when I say this, when I say eat a plant-based diet, this is what the world thinks, and this was published in the Journal of Shaming Vegans. Right? This is not what we eat. So using ingredients like this, which are fairly familiar to all of us, especially those of us coming from India, all of these are fairly familiar. You can, these are my food plates, okay? You can eat like this. You can eat like this. And, and I was partly involved with the development of this plate for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And if half of America eats this way, I will not have a job. Right, And when we do this, the, one of the first question that comes up is where do I get my protein from? So I partnered with a bunch of you know, uh, big names in the world of uh, nutrition and cardiology, and we wrote a paper uh, to answer this very concept. And the next one is salt. An average Indian, uh, probably true even here, uh, except for some few people who are aware, an average Indian consumes about 174% more salt, 174% more salt than what is the bare minimum requirement. And that's why you rarely find a household where somebody is not taking a blood pressure medication. And um, extra virgin olive oil, you know, again, it's a, it's a, what I call, I call this an, an alternate fuel to save lives, but be very careful with oils because one tablespoon of oil will add 125 calories. Besides that, if you're replacing, you know, saturated forms of fat to cook with vegetable oils, you'll be better. But then you have to be mindful about the, the caloric burden. And then these are three papers that I strongly urge every cardiologist to read. The first paper is actually the, the most downloaded paper in the history of Jack. And then I was able to partner with those team and write the third paper in the series. Uh, which outlines where basically it's a three-part paper that we put together through ACC. 
and um, addresses most of the questions that people have in cardiovascular medicine. And then in part, in, uh, while partnering, again, I partnered with the American Journal of Pre American Society of Preventive Cardiology. And last year, actually earlier this year, we published a paper, which is basically the ASPC's guidelines, the dietary guidelines for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. And this is another paper, Geeta Sikhan, she is unbelievably a gifted dietitian. Uh, she, again, with ASPC wrote this paper, which I strongly urge all the cardiologists to read. This will be very useful too. And the next one is that when you do this, it, the, the practicality of it, yes, it's easy to do this, but there are so many barriers at a societal level. How to overcome that, how to get these things done. Uh, and uh, it's, 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 it's an art and a skill by itself, but it can be done. And also this document, especially when you are caring for an African-American patient, please use this document. ABC Cardio, American Association of Black Cardiologists make these two PDFs extremely well done. One for women's health, one is actually a heart and soul. It's a free download. All that you got to do is go to Google and type in uh, ABC Cardiology plant-based cookbook. Uh, print it and give it to your patients and say, hey, go home and eat this way for two months and come back you'll be shocked what happens to their diabetes, blood pressure, blood sugar. And, and as a side effect, they will tell you they lost about 25 to 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. And when I say all this, it takes courage. The cardiologists are now going to pay attention to this. The message that I'm giving, it takes courage to say this. And here is the reason why I say, and everybody knows, especially cardiologists know what I'm talking about in the courage trial, where medical therapy and intervention hardly had any difference. But what we know, what we know from the 15-year follow-up of Courage is most cardiologists have not read this paper. What we know from the 15-year follow-up of the Courage trial is who are the people who did the best after we stented them, after we you know, revascularized them or medically treated them, who are the people who had the lowest and the best outcomes? It's not the people who got the most stents. It's not the people who got the best of therapies. It's the people who had the best of risk factors control. And the editorial that went with this federally funded close to $20 million funding, 15 year follow, the editorial had to be titled, do not smoke, eat healthy and exercise. It did not say get the most stents and get a bypass operation. All right. And this is not new. This is not new. Some of you may know who Bernard Lohn is. He wrote this paper with, again, these three men that are listed are pretty much kind of a you know, few people that I worship the land that they walk on. The conclusion of this paper from 1980s was that we conclude that such ST segment depression is not associated with poor prognosis. Rarely is there a need to resort to cardiac surgery. Medical management will offer you lowest mortality. This was in 1981. For having the courage and the freedom to write these words about ischemia, Bernard Lone, God bless his soul, he just passed away earlier this year, and I now give out this book. The Last Art of Healing. I've been giving out this book to my fellows as a welcome gift for close to 10 years, uh, but I strongly urge you. And he, was, he won a Nobel Prize and his face is going to be on the dollar coin next year. So, but then there is a but. Doc, the disease runs in my family. So here are the words spoken by the president of American Heart Association. No old man in my family. Everybody's life has been cut short by cardiovascular disease. People in this room have a duty to change that. A day before John Warner had a massive heart attack while presiding over the 2017 AHA meeting, 47 years old, right? So when are we gonna go get a genetic test, right? So many people in India are worried about the genetic risk. So when are we gonna get a genetic test? Absolutely, there's no need. For the most part, for polygenic risk, there is no need. And here is the proof. Even in the setting of a high genetic risk, if you live a healthy lifestyle, your, your event rate will be the lowest. Okay, right there, the second box, even in the setting of a high genetic risk. And here is this classic landmark paper from 16 in New England Journal of Medicine that even from three large genome, uh, genome wide association databases, even in the setting of a high genetic risk, if you live a healthy lifestyle, the risk of having a cardiovascular event will be cut short by 50 to 60%. And here is another beautiful paper that just came out, even in the setting of a high genetic risk. Here, the sleep was not even factored in. A high polygenic risk, but if you live by very close to ideal life, simple seven, you will spend 20 plus years without a cardiovascular event, even with a high genetic risk. That's why this I love this paper titled, actually I have a poster made out of this paper and it hangs on the back of my office. So every human who ever walks into my office, they, I make sure that they see this. 
that healthy living is the best revenge because you can reduce the chronic risk of any chronic disease by 80, almost 80%, diabetes by 93, myocardial infarction by 81, stroke by 50, and cancer by close to 40%. Then there is a but. The but is this. There are three Americas, right? Hispanic, non-Hispanic, white, Hispanic, and black. Here is the heat map. Whether we like it or not, there is a moral determinant of health. If there is one paper that I want you to read from today's presentation is this, because most hospitals and physicians have become nothing but repair shops trying to correct the social determinants of health. What I mean by social determinants are conditions of birth, early childhood, education, work, and the social circumstances of elders that we have to care for, community resilience and fairness, right? And from Midtown Manhattan to South Bronx, if you take a train, those of you who trained in New York will appreciate this. If you take a train from Midtown Manhattan to South Bronx, the life expectancy gap is 10 years, which is about six months of life expectancy loss for every minute you ride on the subway. Unless we correct that, it's not gonna work. That's why I love this newly uh, designed symbol by the American Heart Association that health has to happen health the promotion has to happen within the confines of the tightly wound loops of social determinants and psychological well-being. If we don't address those two, none of the pillars are going to work. And, but unfortunately, most of us don't connect with our patients along those lines. So we have to spin these wheels. We have to spin these wheels like it's our last ride because we are already financially bankrupt. And if we don't spin these wheels, we are going to be morally bankrupt. And I, this is my final conclusion slide. Eugene Braunwald, who is not a new unknown name to anyone in medicine, especially those of you who went through internal medicine track, right? When he was recently asked, what are the biggest research gaps in cardiology to improve care? The living legend answered, I think the most important thing is that we get rid of cardiologists. What do I mean by that is the next challenge is prevention, prevention, and prevention. Gene Braunwald, folks. So health promotion, this is an issue that can no longer wait. And uh, that's a nonprofit and that's how you can reach me. I'm fairly active on Twitter and um, I will stop here and uh, go on with the next presentation. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the time. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you, Kaushik. That was phenomenal. We have so many questions coming in. Uh, by the way, keep your questions coming. We'll do the Q&A at the end because we have two heroes here with us. And without further ado, we're going to proceed to the second part. Um, and our second speaker is a legend that can hardly be described by words. I've been a fan of Param Devia for about 20 years and finally got to meet him a couple of years ago, and we actually did a talk together live at uh, the API annual, which was really a seminal event for me to be on the same stage as Param. Param is a hero of mine. He started, he's a former um, academician who spent a bunch of time at John Hopkins in internal medicine, did a gerontology fellowship, uh, public health at Johns Hopkins. Thereafter, he went and got certified in integrative medicine at uh, the University of Arizona in Tucson and then proceeded to work at Canyon Ranch in Tucson, I think for over a decade where he was taking care of executives and helping them manage their health, weight loss. And somewhere along the line, along there, he got certified in sleep medicine as well. So he's, he's just got so many cards in his, in his uh, wallet, it's unbelievable. He's currently focused on longevity, executive care and sleep health in his own brand new practice that he started called Moveo Health, Moveo Health. This is also in Tucson, Arizona, where I would love to visit very, very soon. And he's very excited to share with us his thoughts on sleep as a master lever of health. Kaushik mentioned sleep several times as one of the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. And Param is the expert on this. And we are delighted to, to have him as a member of API, as one of our experts uh, in lifestyle medicine and the master of sleep. So welcome, Param Devia. Greetings, thank you, gentlemen. Truly special to be here. Um, speaking uh, from a location outside of my office. So please give me a cue if there's anything better I can be doing for the visual 
for the audio, as well as the uh, next set of minutes. So here we are. So I'm just going to go ahead and start this here. And there we go from the beginning. And is that coming through, my friends? Yes. All righty. So with no further ado, just as mentioned, we're here to talk about sleep. Let's get right into this. You guys have heard this speak about, right? I'm life as an academic looking at lifestyle medicine, but the real opportunity is take it from concept to action, to go from all these things that we were told that we ought to do, and for each of us to take the one step, the next step tonight, this week. What I wish for us to think about is knowing I'm going to be saying many things that you already know about. I'm going to be honoring a few things that have been controversies and help clarify them. And most importantly, I want us to be able to speak about what it is that can be able to allow us to be able to get to sleep, stay asleep, and wake up and live the life you want. That's the reason why we speak of it. That's the promise of sleep. So with no further ado, just know that there's no disclosures. But the one thing that I always like to say in a disclosure thought is this. Most of us have honored evidence-based medicine, but truly there is a guide toward evidence-biased. We like to pick the data that supports our theory. I'm gonna do my darndest when possible to know that there is some differences of opinion, but I want us to be able to honor the straight arrow and the direction of that of our health. So let's get into sleep. What have we thought about? Is this a brand new concept? No, not at all. Right, it goes back to grandma's medicine. If you've come to any of my chats, I like to be able to frame it this way. What did grandma used to say? First and foremost, eat your vegetables, go outside and play, and and get your sleep. This is so cool, right? We do know this in grand spiel that this is an idea, a concept that could be helpful. And what we do know is that it's been traditionally talented, but now it's gone prime time with modern science. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine is not that old. It's only roughly about 45 years of age. The history of sleep is re really up and coming. And it seems that's the reason why it's in every journal. It's in every conversation of People Magazine. It is out there. So I want us to be able to appreciate there is science, but I also want to appreciate where do we bring this into people's lives. Here's an interesting concept. Sleep does not suddenly happen when you decide to go to bed. I really want us to appreciate who we are physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, but also understand that 24 hour life because each hour begets the next, they're all connected. So let's go further with that. So back in the day, I used to stay up late, watch the top 10 with Letterman. Try not to do that anymore, especially since Letterman's not on, but let's talk about it. What is sleep? What is the function? What is the promise of sleep? A classic book called The Promise of Sleep, written by the Stanford University. So I do my rendition of it here. First and foremost, sleep is about restoring. It is about cooling the brain and the body. We know surgery, we know better restoration, we better know recovery when it's cooling. A little bit of trivia, as I'd like to sneak that in any chance I get, what is the coldest hour of our life? It typically is an hour and a half before we wake up. That's a dream. So the next time you see your loved one going, grabbing more sheets to cover themselves, Please know that it's likely that they're in a dream. We don't know what they're dreaming about, but again, a nice way to be curious. Another one, every single night, re reset sodium, potassium, chloride, ATP channels, right? We learned all of this back in the biochemistry physiology days. What I want us to appreciate, if we do not get a chance to reset, think of it. Think of the heart sparking. Think of the brain sparking, right? We could be talking about arrhythmias. We can be talking about seizure-like activity. I'm introducing the concept that sleep is about heart health and about sleep health. The reason myself as an internal medicine physician can be here speaking of it is that when sleep got connected to heart health, it was no longer a topic of interest. It was now real medicine. The year 2000 or so, the sleep heart health study. This is fabulous to give a talk on sleep right after hearing a very deep dive, a heartfelt conversation on cardiovascular medicine. Sleep is a big part of that conversation, as already mentioned. Here we go. You had a good workout? You feeling a few muscles you haven't felt in a while? Do you want to get the full benefit? Get your sleep. One of the biggest things right now in professional sports is having them have a sleep coach. It's been noted that LeBron James sleeps 10 to 12 hours during the professional NBA season. We must honor that if high performers are asked to recover, there's an opportunity here to speak about all of us. You don't need to be an Olympiad to be able to honor the best opportunity. What do I mean by that? You had a good workout. You want to get the full benefit? Finish the workout. Get your sleep. 
That's where muscle, that's where repair. This is where so many helpful things occur. The big topic over the last 30 plus years, inflammation. Sleep is an anti-inflammatory. Think of it as such. It's a billion dollar industry and all these opportunities can be promoted by sleep. We've known this for COVID. We've known this for more or less surgery. We've known this for just about anything. A good night's rest will cure just about everything. But one of the pathways is decreasing inflammation. IL-6, interleukins um, galore, tumor necrosis factor, all of them improve after a night of sleep. More to come beyond the physical. What we want to appreciate again is we're not only physical, we're our thoughts, how we feel, and how we want to connect. So a big part of this is appreciating it as such. 100 years ago, what did we speak of? We talked about IQ, right? Intelligence. What became the big conversation back in the 90s? EQ, emotional quotient. And we've learned really clearly. And until you get a good night's rest, you really cannot do the soothing. And if you can't soothe and soothe that emotions, you cannot be connected internally. If you're not connected here, it's harder to connect out there. So I really wish for us to appreciate a big part of our health conversation now isn't only physical, but as we learned through the pandemic, the mental and the emotional. Sleep is so important. I could go on for hours, but there was a beautiful conversation that just preceded this one. We know that there's so many ways to speak about heart health, and please add sleep to the list. It's so wonderful to hear about the essential eight. It is not a luxury. What I want us to appreciate is that this is a topic that I'm gonna stream throughout these next set of slides. Anything that's good for the heart is good for the brain. And this concept of neuroplasticity is something that we've learned about. And please know that we've said it before, right? You wanna improve your brain, brush your teeth with the opposite hand, learn a new language, what's part of the original? Get your sleep, so important. Now, whether brain health includes memory or not, we want to appreciate all of us want to have the best memory. In a handful of moments, we're going to talk about the stages of sleep. And what we want to do is connect that of understanding what goes on in terms of being able to put memories in and connect them. This gets absolutely very inspiring and very cool. And now let's take a pause. If we're not here to talk about joy, why are we here? You're really bored on a Saturday? There's nothing else you can be doing for yourself? Please appreciate when we honor sleep, we honor ourselves physically, the mental, emotional, and I dare say spiritual, the human need to be connected to others and ourselves. And finally, what's the promise of sleep? The promise of sleep is energy. It's set at the very top of this conversation. The promise of sleep is to be able to get to sleep, more or less stay asleep, wake up, so you can have that morning, have that afternoon, have that evening, to live the life you want. As mentioned here at the bottom, sleep honors health, but also the healing conversation. Now, originally for years, I was speaking of it this way, quantity and quality, you know, in the world of longevity that I'm working in now, as it was just mentioned, these are very important conversations to think about not just longer life, but quality of life. In the speak of longevity, we talk about this as not only lifespan, but also health span. So we do know that without question, optimal sleep gives us an appreciation of having enough very classic, very much a part of one of the first days of training in sleep medicine. What is the top recommendation we as physicians can give to others and possibly ourselves is to extend our sleep time. Majority of us are simply just not getting enough time. We are living in the data age, the information age. We have more things to watch, more things to read than any other time in history. Yet, please know, as much as those are interesting, please appreciate the benefit of giving yourself quantity of sleep. Maybe even start with 10, 15 minutes. It may not sound like a benefit, but the data shows it does. You don't have to hit a home run to be of help. Go beyond that. Quality. Now, this one's a bit more, how should I say, unique. Some of us are aware that we have a sleep disorder. And interestingly, especially the work that I've been looking at the last 20 years, is that many of us are unaware. And one of my goals during this chat is to make you curious, maybe say, hmm, that there is maybe an opportunity for me not just to be able to speak of uh, being timing, but also quality. There may be something going bump in the night that we need to speak of. And the newest kid on the block is this one, the circadian rhythm. 2017, the Nobel Prize was given to the three scientists that talked about we have an internal clock. Yes, we are connected to the moon and the stars, and we know that without question that there is that importance alignment on the clock on the wall, but there's also a clock in your body. Now, I'm gonna interject, especially given the audience I'm giving a chance to speak to here. 
Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine often talks about the medicine wheel. At different hours, there's different type of healings at each organ. And therefore, for years, we used to say, just get, you know, seven to nine hours, which I'm going to talk about in a few moments here. But if you look back at some of the traditional wisdom, they spoke of the benefits of getting sleep before midnight. Why? Liver health, as I already mentioned a little bit earlier, so important, so much of an opportunity. So please get curious about this. But one of the biggest things, and if you take nothing else away from this chat, is this. What's one of my favorite recommendations? What is one of the most helpful recommendations I give to people? Have a set wake up time. You cannot force yourself to go to sleep, but with some displeasure, you can force yourself to wake up. And when you do that, you're going to start creating a rhythm of the body. So what I want people to often do is to start there. Now, you may not do that on a Monday morning, maybe on a weekend where you can start getting your rhythm. We really want to give quantity, quality, and, and rhythm. These are the three legs to the stool of optimal sleep. Let's keep building on this conversation of knowing that when you talk about a rhythm, some of you will have a morningness, some of you have an eveningness. There is a genetic propensity. Some of us are night owls, some of us are much more morning people. Learn your rhythm. We do a lot of this in corporate America, but all of us should be able to appreciate when do we peak. But first do that with quantity and quality and then be able to really appreciate rhythm. So all of it comes together. Now, when I started learning about sleep, I actually had to unlearn things that I had heard about, right? We have these urban legends that we perpetuate. Here's one, we would all wish we could sleep like a baby. Mm, are babies the best sleepers? 18 hours of eat, sleep, poop, eat, sleep, poop. We wouldn't get through a cardiology or a sleep talk very easily if that were the case. So therefore, maybe not babies because they're fragmented, but instead, ah, uh, here we go, teenagers. Teenagers are the rock stars of sleep and don't let anyone tell you any different. What do they do? And what did you and I once do? We got to sleep, we stayed asleep we woke up with refreshment, well, so to speak, because never judge your sleep until 45 minutes later. There's sleep inertia. You don't actually just wake up and see the morning sunshine. That's a beautiful serial type of uh, cartoon uh, commercial that we've seen over the years. So what do we know? Teenagers get to sleep, they stay asleep. Have any of you tried to wake up a teenager before they're ready? fussed out, we should have just left them alone, right? What I want you to know is we're gonna speak of that, that ability to, to get a conversation of what we call recovery sleep. It was easiest as a teenager, but we can still capture that later in life. And I promise we'll get to that. Here's a very confusing one. As I worked in the field of wellness over the past 14 plus years, here it is. Wellness is a marketplace. Well, you'll often see a partial truth and therefore with something that's, what? Not true. And they'll link them together, but just enough to be able to grab our attention. We're seeing this in politics speak all the time. So look at the statement here. We need less sleep as we get older. Yes, compared to our teenage year who benefit from nine plus, us as adults, we basically would get health from seven to nine hours. Now, some, some newer recommendations are saying seven to eight. And I will share with you, I still, still will talk about seven to nine, knowing that I'm capturing that seven to eight, but some people do benefit. What I want you to be able to appreciate, they will benefit from a little more than eight hours on some nights, because most of the studies have shown eight hours and 15 minutes. But again, that is a spread of conversation that then picks the middle number. Where I want us to be able to appreciate, again, isn't getting exact if you're not there yet, but moving in the direction. So much of health is moving in the direction rather than hitting a single magical number. But let me share with you, what is different between us and our teenage career? It's important to know because this is where the opportunity, the target and the excitement can come. We're less deep, we're easier to wake up, right? You wake up that teenager, they're fussed out, you and I, <sighs> give me a moment, I can get right back to it. So I really want you and I to be able to appreciate therefore there's an opportunity to get more deep and to be able to cut down some of these wake-ups as we go through it. So the goal is to get it all at night, right? What I want you and I to know is that seven to nine hours, all at night are naps. So first, second, and third, get your sleep at night. If you cannot get it all at night, please know naps are a great option to be able to total up into that seven to nine hours. So think of it as such, 24 hour time, try to get most of it at night. If needed, be able to strategically get a nap in. But I want us to know that napping is an art. It's best if it's part of a routine. 
What we want to be able to do is be able to try to see it as such. 10, 20, and 30 minutes of napping have been noted, but napping ought to be thought of like a snack. So here it is. If you had a snack before your dinner, what kind of appetite would you have? If you had a large snack, what would your appetite at dinner be yet again? So please see that avoid naps that are too long or too close to bedtime. And again, if possible, look to make them as a part of a routine. Just let that soak in for a moment. Now, you do not get any points for memorizing this next slide. This is taken from the classic textbook on sleep, but let's get an appreciation. Just get a kind of a flavor of what this is showing us. We go from being awake, a brain that's rich and robust with a lot of activity, we drop into this twilight. You're somewhat awake, you're somewhat asleep, you're just falling into sleep. You see a little bit stretched out, you can see a little bit more of the uh, spikes here. And then stage two, you see now it's slowing down, a little bit of facts activity. So why do I bring all this up? This gets very little attention, it's called light sleep. It's probably the worst nomenclature of all time. Who here ever wanted to be a light sleeper? Said no one. But light sleep isn't about what you and I would speak as our experience, it's about the stages. This allows us to roll over, to get up to use the washroom. It helps us make sure we don't get a bed sore because we can reposition. A lot of great brain health, heart health, a lot of little of everything. But what we do know is the stars of the show are these, stage three and rapid eye movement, deep sleep and dream sleep. And guess what did we do really well when we were teenagers? Yes, indeed. These are the conversations. We did more deep sleep and dreams. So what I want you and I to appreciate is that this is what I would want us to think about because this recovery sleep is really the key opportunity. And we talked about this within the framework of lifestyle medicine. Hmm, why am I bringing that up? It ain't random. It is because of a classic concept that I don't hear other people speaking of. Your daytime sets up your night and your night sets up the next day. It's elegant. It's really a beautiful conversation of how it all flows together. So let's get into these conversations. But before doing so, I want us to really learn a little bit more of sleep. Just on the previous slide, we talked about the different stages of sleep, being awake, stage one and two, which is light sleep, the famous deep sleep, stage three, and rapid eye movement, better known as dreams. So I speak here to roughly eight hours, right? Seven to nine, just take the middle number. We are here to be able to start it artificially with me, talk about the first half of the night you will. What I would want us to take a look at here is color coding it. What do we see more in the first half of the night? We see more deep sleep. What goes on during the deep sleep is fabulous, fascinating. You repair, you put in growth hormone, you put in proteins that repair the body. Said again, you had a good workout. Do you want to get the full benefit? Get your sleep. It is really that awesome. Take it even a bit further. The second half of the night, what do we see here? In terms of that blue, we're seeing rapid eye movement. Here it is. Part of your brain called the limbic system opens up. What does the limbic system do? Clears the negative. So what we know is mental and emotional clearing happens every single night. I'm not talking about the meaning of dreams. I am not so smart to be able to understand that. But simply as a starchy former academic, it is about clearing the negative. Think of it, right? You more or less could really be upset about something, get a good night's sleep, wake up and saying, you know what? We can deal with this. This ain't so bad, it's so important. What I want to do is come back to this in a moment. No, better yet, I'm gonna speak of it now. Many people speak to the fact that they have a hard time falling asleep, but I want you to know it's natural and normal every 90 minutes or so, every 120 to basically 90 to 120 to wake up, roll over and reposition. Think of children, they do that. They'll wake up three to four times and reposition themselves, maybe open their eyes, smack their lips, put their head on the pillow. Now, if you're worried about sleep, your mind gets going, and now you're gonna helicopter and get your more or less adrenaline flowing. I want you to think of that conversation with this. What happens typically is somebody does their deep sleep, they're exhausted, and now they're doing more dream sleep over here. When they are doing more mental emotional clearing, what can happen? Classically, I people tell me this, hey man, I get to sleep and it's somewhere in the middle of night, 3 a.m. or so, I wake up and I can't shut it off. I hear that a lot. I don't even see that written about a lot, but I hear that a lot. So I really want you and I to now appreciate mental and emotional health isn't just something that we're going to ask our sleep to do, 
but that's the reason we want to honor it during the daytime. If we don't honor it during the daytime, it still needs to be clear. And if we do not give it a clearing during the daytime, the sleep, the dreams will do its best, but regrettably, it can be too much and therefore bounces out of sleep. Again, an opportunity to appreciate how daytime sets up nighttime and vice versa. Go a little deeper here with me. Now, I want us to think about this in the concept of memory. This fascinates me. During this deep sleep, I want us to appreciate, think of a panorama of the day you just lived and what we want to do and to think about it as such. It's like Sergeant Joe Friday. You're just gonna take in facts. You're like, oh, that's a good picture. I wanna get that image in my mind. Oh, that's an interesting fact. Let me write a post-it note. So you're putting Polaroids and post-it notes into your brain. How cool is that? Now wait, it's one thing to bring in facts. The next one is to connect them. What you'd want to know is in dreams, you're like, oh, that post-it note, that picture, they belong together. It wasn't spoon fed to you. It wasn't connected for you during the daytime, but you were able to do it thereafter. So what I would want you and I to know is this is awesome that it even goes further. It's like you have a file cabinet, you open it up in your brain, you're connecting the new thoughts with the previous. What is that? Creativity problem solving. One more time, what does sleep do for us, my friends? Helps us physically repair, clear out the negative, be able to bring in facts and be creative problem solvers. Who wants to do this here? All of us, the promise of sleep. Give it time, give it quality, give it rhythm, and it will give to you. Now, what things can be waking us up here? So I really want us to be able to be curious about this. So this is my list as an academic, not just speaking about one thing, but head to toe. We're gonna to talk about it, sleep apnea. Now, snoring is a very common complaint. Two thirds of people snore don't breathe well. In a perfect world, which I hopefully will get to sooner than later, is anybody who snores will at least do some screening for apnea. I have made it such an important part of my process. Every executive that comes through, I screen them. Now, screening isn't just speaking to them. Screening is a simple at-home test. The price point is coming down. It's much easier. You don't need to go into a laboratory. We don't want to miss sleep apnea. Why? The year 2000 sleep heart health study showed that sleep apnea was like being a tobacco user on heart health. Whoa. Number one cause of death and dying of the world that we live in. We just heard all about heart health and its importance and a huge opportunity. And sleep has a beautiful connection here. Because of heart health, sleep became real medicine. Here it is. And this is the controversy I'm going to give to today. Even though the literature says daisies don't have a higher risk of restless legs, from my simple experience, I can't say that I've worked in India. I can't say that I've seen every daisy in my zip code but I have seen a high percentage of them. Maybe it's selection bias of those who are coming to them, but those people with restless legs, and I'm gonna to speak to it. Here's something else you don't see in the literature. My mentor many moons ago said, hey, a lot of people who have teeth clenching and grinding also are restlessness and vice versa. He said there's a two thirds correlation and he was right. Even though the textbooks say it's not connected, and I don't even know why they say they're not connected, but I will share with you, it's my humble opinion. I pick up a lot of this. So I always want to make sure I find apnea, restless legs, teeth grinding, and clenching, because these are my big three. Don't miss this, pain. When you are in pain, does that help you sleep? Not at all. And therefore, also, if you don't sleep, you're more likely to be in pain. About 14 years ago, the American Academy of Sleep changed their statement. They used to say, either see a pain doc or see a sleep physician. Now they say, yes, go see them both. This is one plus one makes three, honor it. Medicines can be disrupting our sleep, caffeine and alcohol. We'll get to that in a few moments. The room environment. We're gonna start talking about what you and I can do tonight to be able to get to sleep, stay asleep and wake up and live the life we want. Mimic nature if you would. What does nature do every single night? Gets cool, comfortable, dark and quiet. Cool, comfortable, dark and quiet. Now I purposely did not say what temperature. What I want you to know, cool is very subjective and I want it to be comfortable. So just know that cool, but doesn't mean cold. Every year somebody publishes a number and it drives people insane. And I get way too many emails and phone calls, but what is it about 65? I'm like, oh no, yes, but maybe not. For me, that would be frigid. Please honor yourself. Medical conditions that we must take a look at. Depression, anxiety, about a 90% overlap on sleep. Depressed, anxious people are more likely to sleep poorly. People who sleep poorly are more likely to be depressed and anxious. 
go even further, hormone changes, menopause. I know the lady is going, really, man? Adding one more thing to the list. We know that during times of menopause, not only collagen and skin uh, turgor is not the same. We know all collagen, like that of the air pipe, can get softer. So therefore, it can be a collapse of the airway or partial collapse, the apnea or the hypopnea. Even if there's not weight gain, there can be a tendency toward more apnea. Just something to think of. I'm not saying it is a one-to-one -one correlation, but it's an association of sorts. Let's speak of it. How many times is it normal to get up and go to the loo? Zero to one, normal. Two, normal-ish. Three or more, you want to talk to someone. Please give yourself an appreciation that this is a huge opportunity to be able to be curious. Yes, we're gonna work up kidney, look up any bladder irritation, infections, mend the prostate. But the number of times that I, this was my clue that there's a sleep disorder at night warranting some further investigation. This classically is one of my favorite things to be curious about. Very important, essential. If you have an irritation of the brain and the heart and wanna know about your sleep, let me just be really classic about it. A small arrhythmia, poor sleep, it's likely to become much more of a sustained arrhythmia. You have some small seizure-like activity, poor sleep, you're more likely to move on to something that's more sustained. Quote, unquote, small heart attack, whatever that exactly means, poor sleep, you likely go on to a massive coronary event. We do know without question, even a small stroke, poor sleep goes on to a massive stroke. I don't know why we don't speak more of this, because again, Small diseases can become big diseases and there are certain levers we can pull on. Really important, autoimmune. When our body is inflamed, I just want you to think of the word inflamed. The body is irritated. Myself, 30 years ago, I was diagnosed with autoimmune disease. What I would want us to know is that the person with more inflammation has quote unquote a fidgety brain. We see this classically in sleep studies. They get to sleep, but you just see them basically bouncing around a fair amount. These are individuals that we may need to be temporarily aggressive. What I mean by that is maybe for some pharmaceuticals to be able to level them out. Let me give you a quick word on pharmaceuticals. This is my bias. What I would want us to think about and to go deeper into is understanding this. We do know without question that medicines can be helpful, but I think of them as a bridge and not as an island. If you had brain trauma, brain surgery, I do see that, that there is a conversation of maybe longer term medicines, but for the vast majority of other people, it's be able to get them through an event and experience in their life. So in other words, most medicines should not be long-term. What I'm getting at here, sleep influences health and vice versa. Now, I do know, and I think somebody had just kind of buzzed me here saying that, you know, in terms of the scheduled time, but I would like to keep going at a few highlights. I promise that you will have the slide deck here and we can always set up more talks in the future. But let me hit some of the highlights as I want to respect your weekend and also the time that you guys want to be spending on other topics as well. Or so, you have a bit of time. You can keep going another 10 minutes or so. All right. Thank you, my friend. But keep me honest here and to everyone who's given us their time generously. No, we're, we're getting tons of questions and people are really engaged. And we appreciate you joining us from a hotel room in the middle of a family med wedding. So we want to be respectful for that too. Honored, honored. So here's a fun topic to think of, and this really be beautifully speaks about what was talked about the previous hour, metabolic syndrome. So we know when somebody is more inflamed, blood sugar is poorly managed with insulin resistance, vascular irritations, hormonal shifts, really speaking about the stress hormonal shifts here, is that they take a look at this, the metabolic syndrome is much more likely to occur. We know metabolic syndrome is much more likely to lead on to heart disease, strokes, dementia, and early but passing, meaning not living your destined number of years. So we know that more or less poor sleep can be promoting high blood pressure, higher weight, poorly controlled blood sugar, and higher cholesterol. Now, some of you may remember that we used to speak of metabolic syndrome as syndrome X. What I would want you to know is there was a really neat group of authors that spoke of this and said, wait, if you had sleep apnea and did the logistic regression, what do you find? And what was quite amazing, when they found the syndrome Z, when they took a look at it on syndrome X, what was the most famous factor, the number one factor? Obesity, interestingly enough, because there's so much that we could speak about here. But number two, not saying that others are not important, but when you put sleep apnea in the equation, sleep apnea was the second most impacting factor. Again, not to say blood pressure isn't critical, blood sugar, 
as well as cholesterol. But I just want us to appreciate, it's not here to debate who's number one, it's really to speak about how all these come together. It's not one thing, it's many things. Now, if you guys were following a sleep run video, this would make it very easy for me to pick up who's sleepy. But this next slide annoys most groups I've speak, spoken to. So this might give you the clue that you're the sleepy person. Let's take a look. Right here, it's not normal, the following are not. It's not normal to fall asleep if reading quietly in the afternoon. Even if it's a boring book, you should be awake. It's not normal to drift off in an afternoon meeting or lecture, all right? Keep going there with me, my friends. It's not normal to fall asleep on an airplane. I'm not talking about red-eye flights. Not normal to fall asleep watching television in the early evening. I'm not talking bedtime, and that's a whole debate itself. Not normal to fall asleep when you're a passenger in a car for an hour without a break and ready for the zinger. Not normal to doze off while at red lights or at stop signs. So this one, you know, gets some smiles in most audiences I speak to. Here it is, between Canada and the United States for the last several years, pandemic not so easy to collect the data, but they show drinking and driving leading to fatalities. But sleepiness caused more fatalities than drinking and driving. I'm not here to minimize the impact of drinking and that of mistakes and death, but I want us to think about it. Sleepiness is an impairment. How many mistakes do we ever want to make as physicians? Ideally none, to err is human. But going beyond that, we do know that whatever we can do to mitigate, to lessen, to ameliorate the number of mistakes we ought to. So please appreciate, these are not diagnostic, but they get us curious. I'll also be curious if you hear somebody says, I don't need sleep. Hmm. Other person says, I'm fine with four to five hours. Maybe, but that's only one to 2% of the population. I seemingly have met every one of that one to 2% of the population. All jokes aside though, I understand some people learn to acclimate to that of other people on the opposite side. I am great, yes, I sleep, I get 10 or more hours. That could be normal, but that person may just be so sleep challenged that they have to sleep longer to be able to get a few hours of quality sleep. I catch up on the weekends. What we do know some people genetically can, most cannot. I'm a great sleeper, I can sleep anytime, anywhere. I literally heard that in my office before I went on my recent travel. And the person was really gloating and they were really not understanding why I was concerned. They thought I would be happy. They actually were a little disappointed that I wasn't smiling. These again are concerns, be curious. Go further. If you're seeing somebody with traffic accidents, occupational mis uh, uh, hazards, mistakes, high blood pressure needing not one, two or more medicines, blood sugar that's poorly controlled, especially fasting blood sugar despite normal A1Cs. What we do know is weight gain that does not follow the energy in, energy out. Cancer, we know this from the nurses study, women that worked all night, more or less were at higher risk of breast cancer. We're still teasing that data set apart. We know about depression, we spoke about earlier, memory impairments, so critical to be able to allow that short-term, long-term, professional performance, academic struggles, quality of life, and productivity. Be curious. These are not diagnoses, these are just curiosities. Always appreciate that's not always obvious. Simple sleepiness does not kill you unless you're behind the wheel of a car. 16 hours awake or six hours of sleep perform as if your alcohol level is 0.05. This is the cutoff in Europe, also in the state of Utah. In other states, 0.08, but just appreciate. That's the reason we're saying truck drivers, after a double shift, you have to pull over. And in the state of New Jersey, there's actually legislation about this because we don't want to make mistakes. As mentioned before, sleepiness may be a more common culprit than alcohol. Here's a few more. Let's take a look at it. Mistakes. None of us want to make them. They did the study over 14 days. TIB is time in bed. Eight-hour guys and gals, more or less uh, healthy well. Over 14 days, what did they do? They just put up a light and they added a button. The fewest number of mistakes. They often say at the end of the study, they got a little click happy, but still overall good attention. Look at this group that had no time in bed. One night of no sleep, eight mistakes. One night of no, second night of no sleep, 13 mistakes. Third night, 15. Who wants to be that person? Who wants to hire that person? But I want us to be able to appreciate the confusion here. So take a look here. If you've been up for four nights over two weeks, you're making as many mistakes as somebody who's been up for three nights straight. This person knows they're being bullied. They are being terrorized. This person, quote unquote, may or may not. Be curious about this. Sleep deprivation accumulates.
keep going here. Hunger, really important. This is one of the things that got me into sleep many moons ago. The sleepy person is the hungry person. Like you're stressed out or sleepy, your brain makes chemistry, says, give me sugar, give me fat, give me now. Sugar, fat, now. Sugar, fat, now. It doesn't care if you read the textbook of nutrition. It doesn't care if you've attended every lifestyle symposium. The stressed out person, sleepy person seemingly has been hypnotized. And I want you to know as we can speak about all the different uh, neurochemistries, these are just the beginning, neuropeptide wide, orexin, ghrelin, leptin, but the sleepy brain is the craving brain. So be curious about this. So also here it is again, if you don't sleep well, you're hungry. If you don't sleep well, you don't make growth hormone, proteins, testosterone to repair the body. So what do you feel like doing if you haven't slept? You'll want to sit and you'll want to eat the processed foods. It's not you're like saying, hey, I attended that great talk. Why am I still driven to do this? We're as sick as our secrets, as they famously say. I hopefully unveil the secret. So again, why we call this the master lever, it is as such. Met sent but four, but one more time. When you don't sleep well, you're hurt and vice versa. Also, in the interest of time, I won't read through this, but the ADD brain looks like the sleepy brain. They did this amazing study in young children. They went to an ADD clinic. They looked at the children. They looked at their breathing because of tonsils and other dentition. Those who didn't breathe well and they corrected them, made them better breathers, made them better sleepers. A month later, they tested ADD. Those children no longer tested positive for ADD, but it wasn't all the children. It was a portion of them. So do know it's about 30-ish percent. It's a big bite of the cookie. It's not everything, but boy, if we can help people be more attentive, we can connect them to their best life. A lot of mindfulness is about awareness. With poor sleep is poor awareness. If you're not aware, you cannot be setting your intention. You can't practice your best lifestyle. Now, I know I have some more slides. And again, you know, my friends, I have stuff that I could cover, but we can maybe hit it in Q&A as I'm sensitive to time. So if you guys could give me some guidance here, I could keep going, but at the same time, I wanna leave enough time for Q&A. About five more minutes. <coughs> Deal, I'll take this it. There's a lot of questions, Pankaj. I think it's a good idea to wrap it up so that we can have our questions answered too. So, okay. Yeah, the, the five I'll, minutes is good. And then let's yeah, I'll, 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 I'll do this. Let me just hit the big one, sleep apnea and restless legs because this gets misunderstood, but I will do that and then we'll get into the rest. And then I'll summarize the very end. So restless legs. Here's the acronym, it's URGE, U-R-G-E, an urge to move the legs, but it's a misnomer. It can be the arms and the torso. Please know that. And for some, it's needing to stretch. For others, it's needing to rub the feet. Others, to fan out the toes. For some people, they just need to reposition. And here it is, night to night, it can be different. When I was first asked if I had, I'm like, no. That night, I'm like, oh my God, power of suggestion. This is awful. By the end of the month, I had to go back to my colleague said, oh, you said no said I didn't know what I didn't know. It's more likely to occur at rest or in the evening hours when you're in bed. When you get up, when you move, you reposition. These are when you feel better, but a couple minutes later, it builds up. If you have a teenager saying they have growing pains, like I used to say, it's unlikely that. It's more likely to be, again, restlessness and also teeth grinding and clenching. But what I want to do, and I'm just gonna get right into it, and I want you not to look at all these words, the dopamine factor. Everybody is low between 9 and um, 9 p.m. and 3 a.m. People with restlessness are even lower. And what we want to do is dopamine relaxes sympathetic tone. So what I would want you and I to do is to really look at this. <clears throat> Here's the big one, iron. I want people to have ferritin checked. If you look at the basic ferritin, it says 25 is a cutoff. No, the old textbook said 50. No, the new textbook says 75. So if you have restless leg symptoms, then we want ferritin to be above 75. It doesn't mean everybody's ferritin should be above 75 if there is the restless leg symptoms. Let me just finish it up. Pregnant women, third trimester, classic. You can't give them the medicines because of the health of the baby. We just make sure they have enough iron. B vitamin deficiency, too much caffeine buzzes the nerves. Blood sugar that's high or low can irritate nerves. Kidneys that don't flush are toxic to the nerve endings. Rheumatic illnesses, inflammation at small nerves. We also know thyroid up or down and Parkinson is a low dopamine. So dopamine and also nerve irritation and it can vary to night to night. Treatments as mentioned, check that iron, please, that ferritin. Give them some magnesium. I look like a hero. 33% of the time they improve. Vitamin B, but there's some studies that say, say C, D and E. 
D has come back in the literature just in the last set of months. Antidepressants, antihistamines can make it worse. Some Benadryl can be really obnoxious. Check the thyroid as mentioned. We may need to take a look at what kind of medicines we could help with. Gabapentin is now first line. No longer dopamine agonist, because dopamine agonist only lasts for about 10 years. Gabapentin is back. Finally, hard to know, but massage, hot bath, stretching at bedtime, any of that can be helpful. Now, give me two more minutes and let me wrap this up because I want to hit the apnea. Apnea is airway, ABC. You want to be able to breathe through the nose, behind the tongue, you want an airway. So we know that apnea is a full collapse, hypopnea is a partial collapse. What we do know is you score it. Less than five, everybody <clears throat> can clear their throat. Five to 15 is mild, 15 to 30 is moderate, and above 30 is severe. And we can go through the debate here. Insurance companies let somebody above 15 to get easily treated, but somebody that's landing in a cardiology office and potentially with the stents and anything else, we treat above five. So high blood pressure, cardiac disease, brain disease, emotional trauma, more or less you know, bad depression, bipolar disorders. These are the people we treat even lower. So what I want to finish up with here is this. It has a high mortality. When you have apnea, it's like being a tobacco smoker. More likely to have arrhythmia like atrial fibrillation, sudden cardiac death, heart failure, memory change, depression, higher sugar. 20 to 40% of adults have it, two to three increased risk of stroke and death. Only 20% of people know it. What we do know is not only a big neck that grows outward, but it can go inward, small chin, the tongue and tonsils are back, stuffy narrow nose, broken noses. Please be attentive to somebody with their history of broken nose. Family history, people drinking or taking more or less benzos at night, men of any age, women at menopause. What I want you to know, and we'll just finish up here, mouth breathers, check them out, take a closer look. People who have a dry mouth or headache in the morning, don't miss these people. High blood pressure, needing two or more meds. Atrial fibrillation, please, the data is no longer subtle. It has been so not 50%, but well above 50% of people with atrial fibrillation should be checked because if not, they need more cardioversion. Let's honor them. And finally, people gain weight and are unlikely to be able to reconnect to their healthy weight. Again, the rest of these slides will be available to everyone. My apologies for not getting through them, but I hit the highlights. Last three things, daytime sets up night. What I want you to know is when you eat well, when you exercise, you set up the chemistry for deep sleep and more or less greater opportunities for rest. I want you to learn something that's very soothing at night. Mindfulness meditation, as mentioned. Also, I'd love people to be able to find out something routine that soothes themselves. We teach children to soothe. We're all big kids. If you do not honor your mental emotional at night, that middle of the night, that second night, part of the night will be much more grumpy. Please appreciate daytime sets up night, night sets up the next day. You guys will have my contact on the very end of all of this is my contact. If you have thoughts, questions, good jokes, please let me know. I look forward to knowing you and I thank you guys for the shared time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Param. That was fantastic. Two thumbs up, big round of applause to Param Devia and Kaushik Reddy, both of our speakers. Uh, we have tons of questions. We still have 192 people on, on this uh, presentation. Srini, please take note of that. Lifestyle medicine is popular and the API audience wants it. This is the highest number I've seen in a long time. I'd like to welcome Dr. Satish Katula, Vice President of API, uh, who has joined us. He's gonna help me with the Q&A. He also uh, wants to say a word or two to our presenters. Well, thanks Pankaj and thank you Srini for having me. Uh, what a presentation. I mean, both of them are like world-class. I mean, I heard uh, Dr. Reddy last month in Atlanta so it's very, very impactful. And thank you so much for coming and educating us today. It is a really, really important topic that uh, you know, we uh, focus on medications, but not so much lifestyle. I think uh, there should be more incentive for primary care and other specialists to focus on lifestyle to minimize medications and improve people's health. So this is really a movement. So uh, thank you so much for coming and uh, doing it today, so. Awesome. So I'd, I'd like to kick off with a question of two of my own. A lot of the questions are uh, have this uh, theme of, uh, you know, where's the evidence for this and so on. A lot of people are asking for your slides. So if you could both uh, let us know if your slides would be accessible and how we can share them. 
uh, that would be great. My first question is for Dr. Reddy, and that is about uh, whole food plant-based diet. I mean, I think you, your strong message was that you know, the biggest lever of health is food and only about, uh, uh, it's the number one and the smallest percentage of people actually eat the re recommended uh, servings of fruits and vegetables. You talked about a whole food plant-based diet. Yeah. So my question is, does one have to be 100% whole food plant-based, i.e. vegan, or would 90, 80, 75% uh, do the job? And is it linear, the benefit? Yeah, great question. And when rubber hits the road, that, that becomes an important issue because uh, yeah, and uh, as based on you know the highest level of evidence that's made it to the guidelines, uh, both the USDA, cardiology, European society, pretty much all over the world, is uh, the, the, the higher the concentration uh, of whole food plant based on a plate, higher the health benefits. So it's again each one of us will have to make an individual decision uh, to you know we, again the mission is not to make another me out of everybody, uh, one is too much, as I've heard. Uh, so, but the mission is how to work with our patients, friends and family, and enable them uh, uh, to bring out the healthiest version of themselves using their value systems where they are. So along those lines, the evidence is clear. The, the higher the gradient of plant-based material on your plate, the healthier you shall be. And that's, that's not just for cardiovascular disease, but all the societal guidelines, uh, all the dietary guidelines, not just from the U.S., from across the planet are in support of that. Uh, that's, uh, to the other part of the question, does everybody have to be a vegan? It's a personal choice. It's a personal choice. And the practicality is that if I meet a patient who wants to change, uh, he or she, they want to change their diet and lifestyle, but they are used to eating, you know, large portions of, you know, whatever, you know, cheeseburgers and French fries and use Coca-Cola to wash them down. And they hear a discussion like this, either through a clinic and they want to change. Hey, doc, the, you know, I would love to do that. Instead of eating that food, I'm going to transition to a large bowl of green salad with sprinkle some nuts. But I also want to have a sliver of, uh, you know, grilled salmon on top of it. So just because I don't eat and if I push the patient towards my way of eating, I'm going to fail him and everybody else. So yes, we have to meet where they are and nudge them towards slightly increasing the, the plant-based material, unprocessed, whole food plant-based. And whether they go 100%, you know, I call it, you know, plant-based, plant-pure, plant-perfect. Uh, it's their call. Awesome. One more question kind of along the same lines is about protein. And there's a lot of controversy about how much protein is it 0.6 grams per kilogram? Is it one gram per kilogram? Uh, there were some recent studies that showed, especially for seniors, that maybe it's you know 1.5 to 2 grams per kilogram. And uh, how, is that possible to be met following a 100% plant-based diet, vegan diet? Yes, yes, uh, it is. So I'll answer the second part of the question first. And absolutely, yes, it can all be met uh, culturally, if you look at it, and across the world. Right, and uh, especially those of us who come from India, which I think most of us on this channel, is um, all cultures, no matter where we come, ex and ex the one exception being European cultures. And it's just interesting. I really don't know the evolutionary reasons as to why that happened. Most cultures figured out uniquely combining a, some form of a whole grain that is native to a form of beans. When you combine a whole grain to beans, the amino acid profile, this beautiful heat map, which became the gold standard, came from uh, uh, Dr. Gardner's office in Stanford, uh, and I'll be more than happy to link that paper, is that when you mix a whole grain with any type of bean lentil, you will completely get all, every plant, I want to repeat this, every plant-based food has all the nine essential amino acids. That's been proven beyond doubt. This notion that a plant-based protein is incomplete is not true. That being said, what is also not true is that at, a, at an individual level, you know, the protein requirements, you know, RDA is the bare minimum requirement. But if you're elderly, if you're bodybuilding, if you're lactating, if you're pregnant, or if you're training to be a world-class athlete, yes, you do need more protein, uh, usually around probably 1.6 to 2. And we kind of address this, all of this in the paper that I was the primary author, and I showed a slide on that. Yeah. So yeah, protein is important. And that's, that's literally what protein means that from an etymology point of view, Proteus has in important. <laughs> um, that's where the word protein actually comes from. 
So yeah, don't, and also along with protein, the most important thing, an extremely common problem, especially amongst our gene pool is sarcopenia. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you look at that, what the workload, you know, the strength training, once you do adequate amount of strength training, protein becomes a non-issue after a certain point, which is about 1.6 to 2 grams. After that, it doesn't really matter. You take too much protein, it's just going to go waste because, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. And Thanks. if I can That's add great. to that, the, this, the sarcopenia conversation, a former gerontologist, that data is really robust. And if we want to take a look at better blood sugar management, if you want to see that actually it's an endocrine organ, we do know that when you're doing muscle work, you're doing actually really great benefits for uh, memory work and neuroplasticity. So if there's one thing I can say, and as mentioned, us, um, for the majority of us DACES, we are basically less lean. And if there's one call to action, yeah, of course, I'm going to talk about sleep and all the great things uh, Koshik is speaking of, but lean mass. I want people to appreciate it because they step on a scale, they think it up and down, they think of body fat, body composition is a real conversation, lean mass. That is really the ticket to quantity, quality, living the life you want on your terms. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For a question for you, uh, you mentioned that uh, sleep deficit accumulates. Can you catch up on sleep deficit by, if you have a, a week or a month of sleep deficit, can you then sleep more for the next month and catch up on it? So what we do know is I love to show a study that I, not uh, to report a study that I saw presented, but I've never found it in print. Men and women serving our country here in the United States, 18 to 49 in this study. For one week, they basically gave them ad lib in terms of a number of bed, uh, bed hours that they would want. So with that conversation, what we do know is, and so sorry, guys, can you just give me one? Okay, a lot of family moving around here. But what I would want you to know is what they did over seven days, excuse me, eight days. On the eighth day, when given ad lib, so they were given a computer, bathroom, basically as much sleep time as they wanted. They all on day eight got to eight hours and 15 minutes. Now wait, they all slept at least eight hours and 15 minutes. And over that set of seven days, they slept an additional 25 hours. Who here is ready to take off next week and say, you know what, guys, don't schedule me for anything. I'm going to sleep an extra 25 hours this week. So there is this concept that you and I can catch up. So the conversation is look to do it the best you can. Now wait, let's uh, sparse this out. One night of poor sleep, accumulated nights of poor sleep. One night of poor sleep, many of us think, oh, gosh, what's going on here? I slept two hours less last night. I need two hours more now. Interestingly, not. We know the brain, the body is incredibly adaptive. So if we are sleep deprived on one night, so let me say it again, healthy, healthy sleep, sleep deprived. The next night you will do more deep sleep and more dream sleep. Mm -hmm. Really fascinating. So also though, if somebody's chronically sleep deprived, I'll see more dreams earlier. So it's one of those things that we also see. And what does dreams do again? Mental, emotional clearing. So I want people to appreciate you can accumulate, you can accumulate sleep debt. You can also improve, but there's some people in the sleep world that are mean and nasty. They say, oh, you can never catch up. And I look at them, I'm like, you should say it's difficult to catch up rather than saying you can never catch up. And just start now. Anybody in the audience, if you can get 15 to 30 more minutes, you're going to get in that direction. So don't think you got to be perfect. You just want to move in that direction. Awesome. I'm going to do one more question, and then I know Satish has some questions too. I have um, one more for you, Param. This was actually in the Q&A, and it's about time in bed versus sleep. And the question was about actually restricting the time in bed to improve sleep efficiency. Yeah, I love that. I saw that there. So let me do my best uh, to answer that. So one of the things that we do know is, and please know, there's not enough behavioral psychologists out there. So I, I'm not, I don't promote any like brands or anything out there, but there's one app that I want everybody to know about. CBTI Coach, CBTI Coach, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia Coach. Uh, this actually put a bunch of industries out of business because this is free. This is written by Stanford and the VA. Some of the best minds in the world have put this together. Why? There's not enough behavioral psychologists to help with insomnia. Insomnia is the pain of sleep. Trouble is getting to sleep, staying asleep, refreshed, not having that daytime capacity that we want to have. Now, there's many steps within this cognitive behavioral therapy. And one of them is sleep hygiene. So let me do a sidebar really quick. When I hear people say, uh, say sleep hygiene, people like put their hands up saying, Doc, I've read Reader's Digest. I am the king. I've read everything. So those individuals saying, great, 
tell me what you've tried and what's your experience. Uh oh, I might have just called them to the carpet. Now all of a sudden they have to go through. Well, you know, I did. Well, I guess. Well, yeah, I could do that again. So just getting them speaking again about sleep hygiene. But one of the things we want to do is to reappreciate this. We want to make sure our bedtime and sleep time is roughly 85%. So if somebody is there laying in bed and not being able to get their sleep, what do we want to know? Is now these tracking devices on our phones, uh, somewhere in Africa is my aura ring. It's, these tracking devices are neat. They are not perfect. They're not meant to be perfect. Use them as a guide. So what, what I would do is if somebody says I'm getting 10 hours of bedtime and I sleep there, see they're sleeping say for six, I'm like, great. Let's get ready. This weekend, I want you to set your alarm and get out of bed after six hours. They're like, wait, I might not get enough sleep. I'm like, initially, and yes, you'll need family and friends to drive you around. I don't want you to doing every, every machinery or anything like that. But then what you do is this, once they get basically 80, excuse me, much closer to getting that bedtime and sleep time to roughly overlap 80%, then you extend them another 15 minutes and you keep going on from there. So therefore you might initially sleep restrict them because now you're situating bedtime and sleep time. One last little pearl there. Say it's not that extreme and you're there and you're ruminating at night. After 20 minutes, if you're ruminating, trying to get back to sleep, get out of bed. Sleep is, bed is for what? Sleep and sex. It's not for worrying, thinking, telling your bed partner they're wrong and you're right or anything in between. Instead, what I want everybody to appreciate is this, get up, but what do they do? Get onto their keyboard. They more or less will get onto TV. Hey, people doing dishes and laundry like dirty house syndromes run amok. What I want people to do is learn to soothe. I want them to go listen to music. I want them to do some stretch. I want them to maybe pull up People Magazine on a comfy chair with a little soft light, read softly and put it down because we all know if you don't finish that article, life will go on. So we do know that we want to practice to soothe. Again, we ask children to do this. Let's ask us to do this as well. Really important. Beautiful. Thank you for those, those answers. Yeah, we're coming <clears throat> to the end of our time. I, I want to, I'll stop talking here and say thank you to both of you. I know Satish has a few more questions and then uh, he wants to say thanks as well. Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, both the speakers. Uh, excellent again. So I, I have a lot of questions here, not just two but from audience, but uh, we don't have time. So we'll take just a couple of questions. I'm going to read from this. Uh, this is uh, from Dr. Nick Nikam. Do we have many studies showing the comparison between conventional treatment versus regimented lifestyle approach in terms of progression of disease processes, improvement in uh, blood pressure, blood sugar, and so forth, quality of life and longevity? 30 seconds answer, please. What, what was the question again? I'm sorry. The question is, it. do we have enough data to really recommend lifestyle, you mm -hmm. know, to improve quality of life, you know, longevity, control blood pressure, blood sugar, and all that. So <clears throat> you yes. have shown a lot of data, actually, you did. Yes, I, I've shown, I think, in, ter in terms of every cardiovascular risk marker, we have the highest level. Again, I, you know, I just want to see if this, this is the same Dr. Nickham that I knew from Houston, if there is. Hello, Dr. Nickham. Uh, I don't know if you remember me, but uh, yeah, but that was a long time ago. But uh, so, yeah, so uh, we, we have highest order of evidence, and that's why every guideline tells us to prioritize lifestyle. Uh, as uh, you know, the, the, all the six pillars, and, and there's no, there's hardly any debate about all the six pillars. Now we have causal link, even for sleep. Uh, American Heart Association recently added sleep, and the the, 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 the issue becomes, you know, like I said during my presentation, um, and nobody argues, quote unquote, about any of the five pillars of lifestyle medicine. But when it comes to diet, is when it becomes a little, you know, argumentative. It's because everybody eats and everybody has a favorite food or way of cooking, and becomes deeply personal. Uh, and, but in terms of, you know, from a cardiovascular perspective, yes, we have data for hypertension, DASH diet. We have evidence for uh, lipids uh, from multiple, multiple trials and meta-analysis, uh, including the portfolio diet, which is profiled in the guidelines, which is a plant predominant diet. And we have biological human feeding experiments that fall on a linear curve. Uh, diabetes, we have impressive data. Uh, and uh, yeah, and also known atherosclerosis and, uh, you know, as far back as Dean's, Dean's data, but there are a couple of other new papers. One is, believe it or not, from Mount Abu, Mount Abu, India. Though, please look up the Mount Abu open heart trial. 
And I just spoke with the author a couple of months ago, and they are coming out with a much larger randomized control trial. And look up in Jack Imaging uh, last year, uh, DISCO RCT, that's the name of the trial. And I don't remember the expansion of the acronym DISCO CT, sorry, DISCO CT. It's a randomized control trial of 90 people with established coronary disease, randomized to con contemporary medical therapy. And uh, and uh, both of both groups are on contemporary medical therapy and randomized to a standardized American way of eating plus a plant predominant healthier version of the Mediterranean diet uh, and uh, uh, atheroma plaque plaque atheroma and volume uh, uh, as assessed by uh, high resolution CT came to a halt not reversal but came to a halt but most important the reason in you know, all the all these imaging aside the whole thing that matters to us in medicine is actual event rates and we know them from extremely well done large uh, prospective uh, observational studies well adjusted and a few randomized controlled trials uh, that clearly showed, including the courage. If you look at the people who did the best in courage trials are the ones whose every, that's why the editorial that went with it read, eat healthy, don't smoke and exercise regularly, which is basically lifestyle. Yeah, so yeah, and again, long-winded answer, but we have the fairly, you know, very convincing uh, data to support all of that. So uh, there was a question, has been a question whether these slides are available. Yes, they are available on API website. They'll be available in a day or two. So you can actually go through them if you want to. Uh, and one last question, I'm sorry, we cannot really address all those questions today. There are like 30 plus and we have limited time. And, and thank you speakers for staying for two hours plus in, in all the audience. And one question is uh, from Avinash Gupta, Dr. Avinash Gupta from New Jersey. I spend 15 to 20 minutes every visit on diet, exercise, lifestyle modification, but it is frustrating to see 90% of them do not follow whatever we tell them until they have an event. Any advice or tips is asking. Yeah, so that is to me is being the one of the most frustr frustrating and rewarding part of what I do. But we, we I just don't give up. It is it's 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 the change has to come from a, at a societal level. Uh, I agree with you. It is frustrating, and also the time because you know the time that we spend. Like I showed in my slide, the most established uh, preventive strategy, smoking cessation, is valued from a financial compensation point of view, forty-seven fold, not forty-seven percent, forty-seven fold fewer dollars than an elective PCI, right? And, and and so we have the money. We have to flip it. We have to flip it. So where the physicians, you know, should we dare calling ourselves a healthcare system? And that's what health promotion is. That primary care doctors, everybody who, uh, you know, who engages themselves. And you need to spend more time because you know you, we are frustrated. Patients are frustrated because in that finite time of you know what nine minutes average when you go see a primary care doctor, how are you going to address twenty seven you know issues and three recent hospitalizations due to congestive heart failure and then do justice to life medicine nine minutes right since and you are frustrated they are frustrated and nothing gets done but if you imagine a utopian world where a, a, a primary care doctor is paid the same amount of money that i would get paid for an elective pci but he or she gets an entire hour with the patient or two and his team of you know behavioral modification people sleep physiologists built an entire team and we are working very closely with the, with the national leadership you know the american college of lifestyle medicine we recently were at we had a speaking role at the white house meeting uh, we are working with cms uh, we are working with many uh, 81 healthcare systems, large healthcare systems, and close to 80 corporate uh, roundtable sponsors who are, uh, you know, in, including insurance companies, major insurance companies, to, to, to bring this to the forefront, to do this as the primary modality. Um, and there's always going to be, you know, need for the likes of I and, and Srini and other cardiologists to do what we do in the cath lab, but uh, the, the the data is clear that a majority of this can be prevented and should be rewarded. Uh, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but I, I feel I feel your frustration. Uh, but I also, you know, yes, I'm in the trenches, but I'm a little bit protected I mean, with a lot of this, you know, because I work full time for the VA, so I don't have to deal with a lot of that. And I get literally 45 minutes for every patient. Every clinic visit is 45 minutes for me. So my so, take on this would be honoring everything Coach is saying and also this. If this was easy, they usually would not be speaking to us, right? Yeah. This is something in which we must honor. All of us have yeah. been part of a journey and all of us are looking to evolve. So I let people, and I usually will say that to them, how many of us who know what to do, but don't do it? 
doctors are we the healthiest people you've ever met no. it usually will bring people down a few notches and saying look we're all in this together let's yeah. take one step at a time i spend a lot of time talking about mindfulness and mindfulness is in unique ways my mindfulness teacher has taught me a direct experience with the present moment without judgment and i say look if we can slow this down and if we can be able to be able to appreciate a few things done very well and then I usually want them to talk about this. And this is a topic that we could maybe do another time and bring a great speaker, motivational interviewing. That technique has been around now for, gosh, 30 plus years from Rolnick. I forget the other author, but it's classic. It's the basically the technique to how to get past ambivalence. Uh, ambivalence. Again, many people will agree that they would want to do it, but then we help people to take the lead. Let them to be in the lead because they obviously don't want me to go over to their house for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and hang out on the weekends with them. They want to be living their life. So if for the rest of the audience, if you're not familiar with motivational interviewing, please seek it out. Very, very much a time to look at it again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kaushik Param, for two phenomenal presentations. Absolutely exceptional. And thank you, Pankaj, for doing a great job being moderator. I think, uh, thank you all, like uh, there are close to 200 people joining today to this session. I think it was on par with the, the two previous sessions we had, like 200 people. This is like a phenomenal present. So I would like request uh, Satish Katula, our vice president of API, to give the plaques to the, the two wonderful presenters. Uh, Vijay, if you can put the, the plaque, I think it, the plaques will be mailed to you. And for all the audience, I think these presentations will be available at the API website. You can go. And I will see you at the next uh, thing. But Satish, please uh, present the plaques. Thanks, Srini. It's an honor to honor our speakers today who did an excellent job, as you said. So Api recognizes Dr. Koshik Reddy for his outstanding contributions in the field of cardiology and welcomes him as a member of Api Distinguished Speakers Club. Thank you so much, Dr. Reddy. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Pankaj Wij, uh, who is my good friend, uh, <laughs> And we recognize him uh, for uh, his outstanding contributions in the field of lifestyle medicine and welcomes him as a member of RP Distinguished Speakers Club. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pankaj. And uh, also, Dr. Dedia, do we have uh, a plaque for Dr. Dedia, which have? I, I think there should be one for Dedia. I think we'll be mailing no. to you, Dr. No. Dedia. And it's my <laughs> honor to recognize Dr. Dedia for uh, giving this talk today, and uh, RP recognizes him as an excellent uh, you know, uh, sleep expert uh, in the field of lifestyle medicine. And, and uh, uh, we, we appreciate uh, your presence here today. Thank you so much. One, one last plug-in, you know, again, please, those of you who have still have deep connections, professionally speaking in India, please look up and support Indian Society of Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, as you know, the disease burden of all of this is exponentially higher and it's just getting worse. And so we founded that organization. Uh, you know, I'm still very actively involved with this from a support role. Um, and it is now under International Board of Lifestyle Medicine. And India has its own board exam, which is on par, which is now a sister affiliate of American College of Lifestyle Medicine. It took a lot of work to get that done. Pankaj was very closely involved with that from the IBLM side of things, the Board of Lifestyle Medicine exam. And for those physicians who are practicing here, please uh, look us up. American College of Lifestyle Medicine, officially the fastest growing medical organization in the world. Um, so come join us because it's not easy, but like they say, only the dead fish go with the flow. Thank you, Kaushik. I think uh, like Pankaj said, I think we may need more lifestyle medicine sessions before the end of the year. Maybe we'll plan next sometime in April or May for another session of lifestyle medicine. I think their presence has been, I think, uh, amazing, the amazing talks. I learned a lot about cardiology is good, but I think a sleep, I think I need to get more sleep for sure. <laughs> what I'm saying. Yeah. So I think we'll be looking forward to more sessions and then please come to a global health summit in wise uh, Vashak Patnam in uh, January. So please attend up there. There is your uh, plaque, Dr. Dedia. Yeah, let me read that uh, one mm -hmm. more time, Dr. Dedia. So Api recognizes Dr. Param Dedia for his outstanding contributions in the field of lifestyle medicine and welcomes him as a member of Api Distinguished Speakers Club. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you in January. Have a great day. Happy holidays. Thank you. Take care, guys. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, speakers. Thank you, Satish, Srini, Thank and you, to all of our audience. Have you. a great Thanksgiving. Bye. Take care.